Hi everyone, and welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, a podcast where our goal is to read the entire Bible in a year, seeking to understand God's plan of redemption while discovering daily and practically your part in it. Hey everybody, welcome back to God's Plan, Your Part. Today we are looking at Leviticus 8 to 10. Uh, It's kind of an interesting thing that happens across these chapters. The first one is basically that Moses is going to be instructed by God how to consecrate Aaron and his sons for the priesthood. Then we're going to see uh, in chapter nine, like the first tabernacle service, there's actually priests, they're able to take offerings. And then finally, what happens when priests don't obey the rules? Mm. It's not great. So that kind of walks you through eight, nine, and 10. Uh, Jenny, as we talk through these things, what questions do you have? What ways do you, what do you want to talk about today? Well, super like kind of silly right off the bat. I like envision. Oh boy! <laughs> in chapter eight, where they're like suiting up, right? Yeah, they it are. instantly yeah. reminds me of like like superheroes when they get their their cool suit or whatever, or like gearing up for their like super serious task. I immediately like this could be an epic movie scene. Well, one thing I was thinking in reading over chapter eight specifically is we have heard about these garments. Quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, if and you... they're a big deal. Like, so much goes into it. Like, so many fine, special things. Fine twined linen. Oh, We've heard Atlanta. about that a lot. And there are special jewels and gems that go on the front. But there's there's been accounts in Exodus, a few in Exodus, and then some in Leviticus, about these garments. And now we're seeing these garments actually put on mm-hmm. for the service. So, in some ways, it's like, oh, this is cool. Like, we've seen Olahab there's and Bezalel, so like, making these things. Up. And now these things are going to be put into practice there is a seriousness with it too because it's like wow okay like the lord has commanded all these things now let's make sure they obey all these things well and you know i think you know it gets really serious when at the end of chapter eight they're talking about um consecrating them before the lord yeah and they have to take the blood of i believe it was a bull yeah there were bulls and rams okay so they're taking this blood and they're like putting it on the different garments to consecrate them to the work of the Lord. So like, you know, it's big time serious because there were passages in the past where it talked about if they leave the presence of yeah. like the yeah. tabernacle or like the most holy place, they are like playing with death. Actually, they would die. That's not the, even a matter of playing with. <laughs> the sacrificial blood is not allowed to leave yeah. the tabernacle. So this is not like a dress rehearsal deal. Like this is the real thing and they have to take it so seriously. And we'll see as the other chapters play out that some people did not take that seriously and had like major deadly consequences because of it. So you had asked uh, before we started recording the episode, we've, we've mentioned a couple times in our readings through Exodus and Leviticus now, the Urim and the Thummim. Mm-hmm. They're very um, strange words. And you were like, what are these things? We, we don't know a ton about what these things are. They are a part of the garb like for the, uh, the priest. The, the breast piece, I mm-hmm. think. So they're part of like the, the chest piece for what the priest is going to wear. Uh, and he actually dons it like specifically for the task. Um, the overwhelming scholarly thought is that these were instruments used for understanding the will of God, Mm -hmm. because it seems like, and and again, like this is very loose just based on like what scholars seem to believe. And a lot of them are not like a hundred percent. This is what they are. Um, But it seems like they generally give a yes or a no. So somehow these were used in a way of understanding, you know, a question or an inquiry from the Lord uh, it's like almost like casting lots or something. <laughs> Just like one side of your shoulders feel heavier than the other. Yeah. So don't, <laughs> don't, don't take that for like, wow, that's, wow, that's so cool. That's exactly what it is. We're not no, sure, right. but it seems like that's what they are based on different times they're mm-hmm. referenced. So if you mm-hmm. hear that room and thumum, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Um, they, it's not just somebody stumbling over words. <laughs> no, it's, I, though I do do that, that is not what's happening uh, uh, at the point. So at the end of chapter eight, the priests have been ordained. It's a very serious task. They are seen as holy before the Lord because of the blood of the sacrifice. Task. They have to stay there for seven days. Mm-hmm. And then we enter into chapter nine where they are now able to like run the services. They're able to, as priests represent the people before God because they've been consecrated. And so they can like, they can do the offerings. They can do the sacrifices. So we have our first complete tabernacle service in Leviticus chapter nine. 
And the end of the tabernacle service actually involves fire from the Lord coming down from heaven and consuming the sacrifice. It's pretty amazing. It is cool. Uh, I was telling Ryan earlier that I think something that's really interesting to me is that I oftentimes would think of these times of priests interceding for the people as like this really distant relationship with God. Like they don't necessarily get a part in it, but through specifically in chapter nine, we see that is not the case because God actually, like the people are not inside the tent. I think they're actually on the outside, but they can see, right. But they can see the fire coming down from heaven. Like the Lord is consuming their offering and it says in the last verse, on uh, verse 24, it says, uh, da, 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 da. The fire came down before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering with the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. And what other instance do you hear of people just being like in total awe that they would have to fall on their faces, but like they are experiencing God through their offerings, which is so cool. And I don't think I gave... Uh, the Old Testament enough credit for how much God is actually a part of what's going on. It's, it is impossible to read through the Old Testament, the whole thing Mm -hmm. and feel like God is what people say God is. Mm -hmm. If you read through this thing the whole way, you will see God loving his people, God desiring his people again for his glory. Right. But he's not terrible. You just have to do what he Mm -hmm. says. Mm -hmm. Um, We talked about this last night and we didn't make it into the cut yesterday. Um, but one of these ideas of holiness, holiness is no joke. So we're recording this on a Sunday. We were at church this morning. We we're singing all these songs about how holy God is. And it kind of has like this newfound meaning for us mm-hmm. as we walk through Leviticus. Um, so we were talking about like specifically all the rules that come with holiness. Like, don't do this. Don't do this. You could look at that and you could be like, wow, that is so restrictive. Like God is so mean and he won't let people do what they want. That's but kind of how I felt, honestly. We were talking last night about if I had, and this is like a little bit bizarre for the sake of making an example, <laughs> but if I had like something radioactive in my backpack and I was like, hey, you know, here you go. Just take this wherever you want. Like do whatever you want with it. Like you would not see that as freedom. You would be like, what the, what the heck, man? Like now I have radiation poisoning and I'm going to die. Like, it would be nice to have ground rules and expectations. Like, here's how to be safe around this. So God's rules are not restrictive. They're (laughs) actually helping you be in his presence because he's holy. So these are not terrible boundaries to set. These are ways Mm -hmm. to enjoy God without being judged in his presence. And the comparison being that, like, radiation is extremely powerful and can take you out without you even knowing it. And it Um, can be very dangerous and and it can be very valuable. And I think, obviously, God's power is much more than yeah. radiation. Yeah. Um, so he is much more concerned with how to approach him because he wants that relationship, but wants us to also be able to survive the encounter with him. <laughs> so these ground rules are set. The The tabernacle service is in place. We see sacrifices offered on behalf of the people. Fire comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. We will see this happen again uh, when Elijah confronts the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18. Crazy story. So it's a really exciting story. I can't wait to get there because Elijah is hilarious. Um, but you'll just have to wait for that one. So then we go into chapter 10, and chapter 10 is kind of a, like, oh, man. Well, I mean, you have these guys who I think, and I was I was going to ask this question earlier when we were kind of ending chapter 8. Yeah. <clears throat> I was thinking, like, they, they take, or they took, well, some of them did, this holiness factor so seriously. Mm-hmm. Like, what does that look like for our pastors today? Like, do we take that seriousness of like living a holy upright life that like reflects God and his plans for his people. Do we take that as seriously today? Now, obviously we're not making offerings on behalf of the people, but like, I think the seriousness of leading a people is still just as necessary. Well, and the, the challenge that is, I mean, I, I am a pastor. The, the challenge that is before us is like, we can represent God well, and we can lead people to experience relationship with God because we can see like God, God doesn't relate to us, re- relate to us like he did in Leviticus, but there are still ground rules. Like God is still holy. That hasn't changed. Mm-hmm. So we don't need to care about God's holiness less. We just have a different way of access through his son, Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, but we kind of have this challenge as pastors. You can either, I guess, I guess I'm speaking directly pastorally, but 
we have this challenge of like, we can feed people what people want, or we can feed people what the Lord wants them to have. And there are very clear, I guess this is like, maybe this is a little bit more direct to culture than we normally speak, but there are very clear challenges in the church today where it's like, yeah, I can, I could let you do whatever you want and you would love being a part of my church and you would feel engaged. But if you're not pursuing a life that is holy before God, ultimately you're just doing something very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so there's this pastoral mandate of loving and caring for people. And one of the best ways we love and care for people is we teach them what God has called us to do. Actually, mm -hmm. um, there is a direct... Uh, mandate. Uh, where's it at? Is this out of the mouth of Moses? Uh, this is not out of the mouth. Um, or is this from this is out of the mouth Aaron. of God? This is a little bit further ahead. Leviticus chapter ten, verse eight. The Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, "Drink no wine or strong drink." Now, this is this is specifically about priests. Yeah. Drink no wine or strong drink. You or your sons with you, uh, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. Now, the important connotation there is that's like while you're on duty. Right. Um. Related to that is one of the thoughts about Nadab and Abihu, who did die, is that they were probably drunk when they did it. Um, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generation. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, and between the unclean and the clean, and you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. So this is the only time that God speaks directly to Aaron, and he tells him what he wants priests to do. Take this seriously. And it is actually applicable today mm -hmm. like we relate to god differently but we still as pastors have a job to distinguish between what's holy and what's not mm -hmm. what's clean and what's not and teach people the laws of the lord and so it's it's a heavy thing but it's a thing when i think done well it's exciting to be allowed to be part of god's service mm -hmm. for god's glory which ultimately just takes us to that final chapter then like these are men that did not take it seriously and yeah. paid the ultimate price. It's kind of odd. Nadab and Abihu. So we, we walk through this very real history, this very real story of God making sure everybody understands you must do this correctly. <laughs> and then lest you die, fire falls from heaven. It consumes the sacrifice. And immediately in Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu are like, sweet, let's try. Mm -hmm. And one theory is that they were drunk. One theory is that they just wanted to do what everybody else was able to do. Like they saw that uh, this happened and they were like, sweet, I want to be part of that. I want to do it. Um, but at any rate, they they did this in a way that they were not supposed to. They came into God's presence when they were not prepared and they mm -hmm. died. And actually part of Leviticus 10 is that Aaron looks back on it and he's like, Oh yeah, like they, they died knew. and they deserve to die. They they could not be in God's presence. Which I feel like takes a lot to say. I mean, he's a literal father of right. those two guys. Um, and so then actually Leviticus 10 ends with Moses being a little bit frustrated that Eleazar and Ithamar are not offering sacrifices. And Aaron is like, dude, Moses, it's been a tough day. Like a lot of crazy things has happened. Let's just chill and make sure we're doing the right thing before the Lord. Mm -hmm. So what a wild story. Um, what a way we have come like a little while ago, Moses was talking to God in a bush. He was like, please let Aaron help me. Aaron was standing before Pharaoh and now he's actually the priest before them. It's kind of interesting. I've already talked about what I think the takeaway is. I don't know if it's okay, but I'm just going to go for it anyway. It is a little bit more of a pastoral mandate today, I think. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening and you have influence over people or you lead people, ultimately we believe now today in a priesthood of all believers. And so we all have an opportunity to represent God before man. And so it makes our task really serious. I know that we, we talk a lot about freedom and how great it is that we aren't bound to the law and we have like incredible freedom before God. Mm -hmm. It is important for us to recognize the serious responsibility that we have and the fact that God is still holy and we don't want to mislead people. Mm -hmm. So I know there are many, many times where as believers, it is tempting to maybe dial down what God says or be really excited about evangelism and like almost hide a couple of things mm -hmm. or take like a, a halfway approach. There could be times when that's great. There could be times where that's effective. There could be many stories where that has been helpful for people to get a little bit closer to Jesus because ultimately God is drawing people to himself. Mm -hmm. I just think if we do believe in a priesthood of all believers, if we do think that we all have this incredible opportunity to represent God before people, 
we should probably represent the whole real picture of God. And we should not be ashamed of teaching people who he really is Mm -hmm. and allowing them to work through it as God works in their hearts themselves. I know there's like a little bit of a movement to dial it down or water it down. I, I just don't think ultimately that's what's good for people because I know that we relate to God differently now. We don't need a high priest before us. I mean, Jesus is our high priest before us, but we're not doing tabernacle stuff. We also don't need to be like another disappointment. What do you mean? Like, we don't need to be another disappointment for people that realize once they're like, okay, Christ, God, I'm so excited about all of them or them. And I'm excited to live my life with these things still holding me back just to find out that, hey, it doesn't cut it to continue on. Well, well, I mean, think about Nadab and Abihu. It's like, well, we just, all we did was mix it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. All we did was like burn something not quite the right way. God's like, hey, sorry, guys. I'm going to judge you right now. Mm -hmm. So... We're not doing people a favor when we falsely represent who God is, I think. Mm -hmm. And we need to be really careful with that. And we need to walk in that well. Uh, Always with grace, but always with truth. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is bring people to know God. Why would we try to make God out to be something that is not? Or manipulate them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. Maybe that hits you a little bit weird because you're not necessarily a pastor or something. It's I take it pretty seriously. And because of that, it pushes me to study and learn and grow more and more and more, which is why we're doing this podcast. And to understand a God who does love us genuinely, but also has guardrails for our our lives. He has incredible power. He can do incredible things in our lives. And also, he's kind of like the sun, where it's like, if you do it wrong, you're going to get burned up. Mm -hmm. So that's not something to take lightly. God hasn't changed. Yes, we have access through Christ. Let's still pursue holiness. 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 <laughs> Let's still pursue holiness in Christ. Yeah. Uh, as we pursue God together. So, this journey is really important to us because I feel like the the more we read the Word, the more we understand who God is. The and more we see Him moving constantly. It's exactly, so strange. Exactly. I mean, shouldn't be a surprise, but what in the world? Uh, later on in Hebrews, we're going to read that God's Word is living and active. So we're actually engaging with the Holy Spirit while we read what He led people to write. You, I wish you could have seen Jenny make a gesture of sharper than any two-edged sword. That was, that was something. So we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our take on God's Word. Stick around and listen to the Word uh, on the second part of the podcast. Before we get in there, uh, we just want to remind you, you can connect with us at any time on social media and YouTube at God's Plan Your Part. Also, we are a listener-supported podcast, so if you ever want to help us out with the ministry that we're doing, uh, you can do that by clicking the link in our description. And now, here's the reading for today. Leviticus chapter 8. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put the coat on him and tied the sash around his waist and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him and tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod around him, binding it to him with the band. And he placed the breastpiece on him and in the breastpiece he put the urim and the thummim. And he set the turban on his head and on the turban in front he set the gold plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all its utensils and the basin and its stand to consecrate them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with coats and tied sashes around their waists and bound caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses. Then he brought the bull of the sin offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull and the sin offering. And he killed it. And Moses took the blood and with his finger put it on the horns of the altar around it and purified the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar and consecrated it to make atonement for it. And he took all the fat that was on the entrails and the long lobe of the liver to the two kidneys with their fat and Moses burned them on the altar. But the bull and its skin and its flesh and its dung he burned up with fire outside the camp as the Lord commanded Moses. 
Then he presented the ram of the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and he killed it, and Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar. He cut the ram into pieces, and Moses burned the head and the pieces of the fat. He washed the entrails and the legs with water, and Moses burned the whole ram on the altar. It was a burnt offering with a pleasing aroma, a food offering for the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then he presented the other ram, the ram of ordination, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. And he killed it, and Moses took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. Then he presented Aaron's sons, and Moses put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. And Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar. Then he took the fat and the fat tail and all the fat that was on the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with their fat and the right thigh. And out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unleavened loaf and one loaf of bread with oil, one wafer, and placed them on pieces of fat and on the right thigh. And he put all these in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons and waved them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar with the burnt offering. This was an ordination offering with a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. And Moses took the breast and waved it as a wave offering before the Lord. It was Moses' portion of the ram of ordination, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil and of the blood that was on the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron and his garments, and also on his sons and his sons' garments. So he consecrated Aaron and his garments and his sons and his sons' garments with him. And Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Boil the flesh at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and there eat it, and the bread that is in the basket of ordination offerings, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his son shall eat it. And what remains of the flesh and the bread you shall burn up with fire, and you shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are completed. For it will take seven days to ordain you. As has been done today, the Lord has commanded to be done to make atonement for you. At the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged, so that you do not die. For so I have been commanded. And Aaron and his sons did all the things the Lord commanded by Moses. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, Take yourself a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And say to the people of Israel, Take a male goat for a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both a year old without blemish, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. And they brought what Moses commanded in front of the tent of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, Draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and for the people and bring the offering out of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord has commanded. So Aaron drew near to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron presented the blood to him and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the long lobe of liver from the sin offering he burned on the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. The flesh and the skin he burned up with fire outside the camp. Then he killed the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons handed him the blood, and he threw it against the sides of the altar. And they handed the burnt offering to him piece by piece, and the head, and he burned them on the side or on the altar. And he washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. Then he presented the people's offerings and took the goat of the sin offering that was for the people and killed it and offered it as a sin offering, like the first one. And he presented the burnt offering and offered it according to the rule. As he presented the grain offering, he took a handful of it and burned it on the altar, besides the burnt offering of the morning. Then he killed the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings for the people, And Aaron's sons handed him blood, and he threw it against the sides of the altar. But the fat pieces of the ox and of the ram, the fat tail of which covers the entrails and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver, 
They put the fat pieces on the breasts, and he burned the fat pieces on the altar. But the breasts on the right thigh, Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord as Moses commanded. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. Then Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting, and when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered an unauthorized fire before the Lord which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said, Among those who are near me I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry your brothers away from the front of the sanctuary and out of the camp. So they came near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithamar his sons, Do not let the hair of your heads hang loose, and do not tear your clothes lest you die, and wrath come upon all the congregation. But let your brothers, the whole house of Israel, bewail of the burning that the Lord has kindled. And do not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Drink no wine or strong drink. You or your sons with you. When you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, and between the unclean and the clean. And you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. Moses spoke to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his surviving sons. Take the grain offering that is left of the Lord's food offerings and eat it unleavened beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat it in a holy place, because it is your due and your son's due from the Lord's food offering, for so I am commanded. But the breast that is waved and the thigh that is contributed you shall eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you, for they are given as your due and your son's due from the sacrifice of the peace offerings of the people of Israel. The thigh that is contributed and the breast that is waved, they shall bring with the food offerings of the fat pieces to wave for a wave offering before the Lord. And it shall be yours and your sons with you as a due forever, as the Lord has commanded. Now Moses diligently inquired about the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burned up. And he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, the surviving sons of Aaron, saying, Why have you not eaten of the sin offering in the place of the sanctuary, since it is a thing most holy and has been given to you, that you may bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord? Behold, its blood was not brought into the inner part of the sanctuary. You certainly ought to have eaten it in the sanctuary, as I commanded. And Aaron said to Moses, Behold, today they have offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord, and yet such things as these have happened to me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would the Lord have approved? And when Moses heard that, he approved. Thanks so much for listening to God's Plan, Your Part. If anything stuck out to you, if you have any questions, or if you'd like to receive a Bible, you can email us at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting us through the link in our description. We love that you're on this journey with us, and we hope you have a great day. See you tomorrow.